God in the now from the work that I tried to do. But one day I went to Christ, so let it be no cause for a frown. When I received my mantle, the good will be the power. So bound for the let me be among the sick. Lunch and rock, 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 most gracious and kind and loving Father. We come to you this evening, Father, with as much humility as we know how. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for the many blessings that you blessed us with, Father. Amen. The very strength in our bodies, the very breath in our lungs, Father. Amen. We know that everything comes from you, Father. And Father, we want to let you know that we're grateful for all the small things, as well as the, the things that you get us through in this life. Amen. Father, we pray, Lord, that you will continue to bless us, Father. That you continue to give us the will and the zeal to do your work. To walk as you would have us to walk, Father. To teach as you would have us to teach, Father. To be an example as you would have us to be an example, Father. Father, we know that we're in a world, Father, that is so dark in the days that we live in, Father. Let us be the light as you would have us to be, Father. Let us be the salt would have us to be, Father, to be to show you to the world, Father. Yes. We just want to lift your son up, Father, so that all men may be drawn to you. Yes. Dear Father, we, we pray for those who may be sick or are going through illness, Father, or spiritual problems, Father, or just going through hard times, Father. Yes. Father, that you may be with them and that they always know, Father, that you are the rock, Father, yes. and that we can lean on you and we can count on you, Father, and that you will always be Father, we pray for those who may be grieving the loss of loved ones, Father. Yes. Father, that you comfort them, Father. And Father, that if there's anything that we can do to help, Father, that you give us the mind to do so. Yes. Father, let us do all things in love, Father, yes. and in truth. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, yes. Father we pray for the speakers tonight and the speakers for the remainder of the week, Father, that yes. you will give them a ready recollection of the things that they have studied, Father. Yes. Father, that they be Talk to us in such a plain <coughs> way, Father, that we may be able to incorporate them, retain them, and to put them in practice in our lives. Father, yes. Father we know that all good blessings come from you, Father. Yes. So we pray, Lord, for the wisdom to understand what we need to do yes. on a daily basis. Yes. Thank you for the, the traveling grace that you've allowed us to, to come here safely, Father. We pray for that same grace as we depart, yes. that we may find things as we left them, Father. Yes. Father, we pray a blessing over this church and all the congregations. Father, for all the churches of Christ in the world, please help us, Lord, to walk the walk, not the sprint, but the marathon. Please forgive us for our sins, Father. In Jesus' name we pray and thanks be given. Amen. School of Religious Studies, how great we are, how you selected us to, to be a host for uh, this year's lectures. We have, uh, I'd like to get a few uh, like out of the housekeeping things out of the way before we get into the program tonight. Uh, we want to announce the, the passing of our beloved sister Marjorie Ray. Ray passed away uh, during part of this week. Uh, her funeral services are scheduled for Saturday, December the 16th at 11 a.m. at the Bowl City Congregation. What we also doing, we also are asking our ladies if you would help out with uh, the breakfast for the repast. Uh, it would be greatly appreciated. Uh, 
just uh, let, let them know who the office called and uh, we'll get that information to you. So we'll pass it on again at the end of service. Also, this evening, uh, we want to continue praying for Sister Ellen Gibbons uh, and her family, especially for her grandchildren and children who are ill. Uh, please, please keep these families and uh, always pray, pray for one another. Keep one another. On behalf of the President, Board of Directors, staff, faculty, we welcome you to the SRS Annual Lectureship. Uh, we appreciate your presence for this year's lectureship. We know that you could be in a lot of places, but you sought to be here, and we are encouraged by that. This year, the theme for the lectureship is from Paul to forgiveness. And uh, we will study, and they will address the study from the book of Genesis. Throughout this week, there will be lessons designed for ministry, men, women, and for everyone. And we encourage your participation in all of the lectures. There's been a program <coughs> designed for your use and your benefit so that you will know the date for speakers uh, that will be uh, involved and participating in this year's lectureship. Hope and pray that you've got a, a copy of it. And uh, please, please, if you have questions, if you can see any of the members of the staff of SRS, they'll be glad, uh, be glad to help you out in whatever way or whatever need you may have. We're just glad you're here. And we're just glad you're here. You can just relax and get ready to enjoy yourself for this evening. We know that everything will be beneficial for you tonight. So our consul leader will come with a, with, a, uh, with a selection. And after his selection, after this one selection, we will introduce our first speaker for this evening. <coughs> Good evening. We're going to start out with um, one selection. Sing how you. Let's sing. When we reach that city of the New Jerusalem, we're gonna sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. How the ransom singers will together lift their hymns, and we're gonna sing hallelujah. Church sing by and by. We'll now hold what joy when we get home, and we're gonna rest beneath that power. Let's go. Well, now in the land where saints will never die, we're gonna sing church sing by. Crystal stream, and we're gonna sing. 
something that you can read on your own. I thought he was going to say something that's not written or recorded. Uh, but since you read what everybody else can read, no fees for you. 
Genesis chapter 1. Tonight I've been asked to share some information about from creation to the fall. My role is to share some information about creation. So what I'm going to do, if you look in your package, it has me Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 27. I'm going to read that entire passage since they have it listed. And since they have it listed, I'm going to read the whole thing to give a context. Once I read the passage, then I'll walk back through it. And as we walk through it, I'll stop along the way, tell your story, make an application that we can do something with what we've read. We're going to read all 27 verses. That way, if you had decided in your heart on Wednesday night that you weren't going to do any Bible study at all for the rest of the week, <laughs> we'll get some Bible reading tonight. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, reading from the New American Standard Bible. If you have a reliable translation, you won't have any challenges or problems following along in this passage. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning. One day. Somebody said, if you read that, that pace is going to take all night. <laughs> then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. That's so interesting. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse. We'll talk a little bit about that. And it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning, a second day. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth. And the gathering of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielded seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with the seed in them. And it was so. One of the interesting observations we'll talk about it in a little while, but when he says he made the vegetation with the seed in them, what God is saying, I'm going to do this one time. And I'm going to put in process reproduction in the, in the seed. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their seed, trees bearing fruit with seed in them and their kind, and God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days, and for years. I'm going to spend a lot of time on that verse. I want you to understand it in context, and so I'll read above and below. And let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, and it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. Then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth in open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters, and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind. God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, be fruitful. And multiply. These are animals. 
be fruitful and multiply. What that says is God speaks the language of the animal kingdom. He's not just a God that speaks to your language. God speaks to the animals. He speaks to the aquatic kingdom. God is such a God that he speaks ant and, and elephant and alligator. He speaks sea moss. He's talking to the creatures. He says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. There was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth and after their kind, and it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw. Then God said, let us make man in our image. I really wish we had time to do that, but we really don't have to be caught. But if I walk that way, just walk with me. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man. Can I show you something real quick, just in case I don't get to that? Look at verse, the language in 26 and 27, when he says, let us make man in our image. And by the time we get to verse 7, it goes from plural to singular. And God created man in his own image. There's a reason for that. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Moses is credited in writing the book of Genesis. And it is through his time that he's trying to learn and understand who God really is. And it is through his writings that we want to find that Moses on one occasion got caught up and, and this is actually Moses writing us, giving us our first introduction to who God is. And it is born through the thirst of Moses wanting to know and hear from God who he is. God, Moses says to God in so many words, God, you know me, but I don't know much about you. And, Mo, and God says to Moses, he says, there's a cleft over there that when I get ready to pass by, I'm going to hide you in the cleft because you can't look at me face to face and live. So I need to show you. My shadows, I need to show you my history. So I'm going to hide you. I'm going to protect you in the cloud. And when I walk by, then you will see my back parts. Contextually, he literally says, you will see my history. All right. And it is from that revelation to Moses that Moses then writes what we refer to as the Pentateuch. And when he begins to, to write about God and his divine encounters with God, he now tells us how things began to come about. It's in the book of Genesis that Moses writes about the beginning that we understand about creation. Verse 14, he's going to say, he did these things for us to be able to number the signs and seasons and days and nights. And what he's telling us is he's putting in order a structure for mankind or for creation to engage with their creator. God is the God of seasons. Amen. That's what verse 14 says. In fact, it opens up by saying, in the beginning, y'all ready to walk through this? All right. And as we go through it, all that is just setting the scene for you to understand what's getting ready to happen. Because I don't want you to think anything about Genesis 1 that you all not to think. And since these are lectures, every now and then, we got to teach something. In the beginning, God, and when he says that, he's not talking about God's beginning. For God has 
no beginning. Y'all follow me? You know, he's sovereign. He's absolute. He's the I am. And, and there's not anything that the God we serve cannot do. There's not a question he can't answer. There's not a problem he cannot solve. He's the God of eternity. Right. Nobody elected him to be God. Oh, and since God. you didn't elect him, you can't impeach him. <laughs> He's God all by himself. Oh, Nobody God. hired him. He's a sovereign God. He's the Yahweh God. In fact, the Bible says he's the God that sits on the circle of the earth. Yeah. God is so big that God says, I sit on the place you live. See, rather than put God in a box and you trying to make God conform to the way that you think, God says, I sit on the very place that you live. Y'all follow that? He says, I'm deity all by myself. So when he says, let me show you something, and then I need to jump to something else. When he says, go back to verse 1 in your, in your Bible. He says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When he says, in the beginning, uh, uh, is that right? If we, if we teach a little bit uh, while we're doing this, in the beginning, Rishaf is a word that talks about in the, in the eternity, not in time. See, the God we serve does not live in time. Listen to what I'm telling you. The God we serve lives in eternity. He visits time. Time only exists in this realm of the dimension that you live in, and God will visit time, but he lives in eternity. In the beginning, in the Rashad, God is eternal. Outside of time, he visits time. In the beginning, God created. You know, for, for, for your language scholars, he created bara. That means to create out of nothing. That's important because we're ready to show you something. He created he bara the earth, heavens, and the earth out of nothing. Now follow that. Yes, sir. Then it says, and the earth was. Formless. The earth was void. Can I give you two words real quick? Just to hit me real quick. The earth was formless. Um, it literally contextually translates from a word, uh, uh, Hayah. H A Y A H. Uh, say Hayah. Hayah. Name your Hebrew speaking church. Uh, <laughs> and the earth was <coughs> formless. It contextually translates, and the earth became. Formless. And the earth to who became desolate. In the beginning, God created Barak out of nothing, heaven and earth. But something happened. And it became wasteful. It became desolate. He didn't create it wasteful. He didn't create it desolate, something happened. And what I want to show you is in when he says God created Barak out of nothing, and every time after that, except with verse 21 and 27 when he creates man, uh, here's what happens. The word that he uses is na'asa. That means to remanufacture from what already exists. Let me tell you why that's important. Because when he says, in the beginning, God created out of nothing the heavens and the earth. But the, something happened and the earth became void. The earth became desolate. Can I read it to you from a Hebrew translation? Now, I'm not, I'm not going to read it in Hebrew. I'm going to translate it in English. But it's coming from Hebrew. Y'all all right with that? If you read this straight from the Hebrew, here's what it's going to sound like. The beginning, God prepared, fashioned, created the heavens and the earth, completed and to be inhabited. Well, I, I can translate real quick, can I? I'm just reading the translation. And the earth became desolate, void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep in the frozen ice. And the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters, the melted ice. Right. So, 
So when you look at creation, in the beginning, God created Barak, the heavens and the earth, out of nothing. Something happened, and the earth became void. The earth became desolate. And now he's getting ready to refashion. And rather than bother your theology real quick, but go check this out. That's, that's some, some of the rationale on how you can say, well, the earth is 8,000 years old, but yet you got DNA structures and fossils that are much older than that. That's because when you remanufacture something, you do what's already here. That's, all right. that's good, preacher. Come on, brother. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Earth became raw and desolate. So when you read what we're getting ready to read about these six days of creation, I'm really not trying to bother you the hours, but I want to show you something. When you read the six days of the Genesis account of creation, this is really an account of a recreation. Every word from verse 2 to verse 27, when you see the word and God made, and God made, it is not the word barak which means to make out of nothing, it is the word Nassau, which means to remanufacture from what exists. All right. All right. And there ain't no reason to bother with me. I didn't write it. Right. And no reason to argue with the text. Yeah. Watch this, watch this, watch this. So, so Genesis 1 is not about a geological history of the earth. In fact, when you get a moment, go read Isaiah 45, 18. Isaiah will say, God formed the earth complete All right. to be inhabited. But when we look at Genesis, something's wrong with the earth, and it's void. He didn't create it that way. It became that way. The same way God didn't create you the way that you behave right now. You became that. You follow that? And God is still creating. You know, you know, and so when he created, watch this, watch this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Here's what's beautiful about creation. The Bible says God thought it. He spoke it. It became. He thought it. He spoke it. And it became. It's not just enough to speak it, though. If you look at what God is doing, see, you can speak something that's in contradiction with what you believe. All right. All right. You speak diet. <laughs> he started, he spoke it, it became. But see, if your confession is not in alignment with what you're thinking, the power of your thought and speech to cause what you're thinking to happen won't happen. He thought it, he spoke it, it became. Y'all see that? Yes, he thought it, he spoke it, it became. Here's what's beautiful. When he thought it and he spoke it and it became, Ezekiel does it this way. Ezekiel says God. He sees God as a circle. Ezekiel says the God we serve is like a circle. In fact, he's like a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And that he is a circle that spoke a circle into existence. Ezekiel says he's the circle who spoke a circle into existence, a circular world. The circle spoke a circle into existence and the circle starts spinning. And as it started spinning, it began to spin out other things. The spinning world of the spinning circle, circle after circle, spinning. And all of a sudden, in that spinning through creation, they become galaxies. And out of the galaxies become stars. And out of the stars become planets. And out of all of this spinning comes something that we call time. And out of that time, he says, I'm doing this so you can measure your seasons, so you can measure signs. And all of this is spinning, and all of it is spinning to a rhythm that God has set. Everything God spoke into existence, it came into existence on rhythm. God has a rhythm. You follow that? 
He has a rhythm. I'm not talking about folk. I'm not talking about against folk who don't have rhythm. Because some folk dance to the sound of the words as opposed to the beat. But God has rhythm. And if you don't walk with God, you got to catch his rhythm. So when he starts to make man, and he says, I'm going to make man in my own image. Oh, I wish I could do something with it, but I don't, got, I don't have time to explain it. But, but, but uh, let me give you this, and, and I'm going to leave it alone because I'm going to go home. But, but go back. Let us yes, sir. make man. Yes, sir. Say it. When you go back and look at your Hebrew Bible, The us is not the God here. There is no Trinity concept in the Old Testament. In order to get a Trinity concept in the Old Testament, you got to read the New Testament back into the Old Testament, and that's not good theology. Let us make man in our image. He's talking to a council. That's why the language changes. He says, let us but then when he gets ready to make man, he says, and God made man in his own image. All he's doing is informing the counsel of that invisible creation. I'm getting ready to do to them what I did to you. And since you weren't there to see me do it to you, you watch me do it to them. And they're going to be in the same image. And they're going to share an image just like you share an image. And they're going to make us family. And the image of God is not about a set of characteristics. It's about a status. I'm trying to tell you something. I'm trying to show you something. See, see, we make the image of God about personality and, yeah. and, and development and consciousness yeah. and, 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 and free will. If you make that all about that, then how you going to answer the embryo that's in the womb? They have no conscience. They have no free will. Then if you say, well, they have the potential to do it, then they have the potential of being in the image. That's not what God said. I'm going to make man in my image. It's a status. All right, all right, all right. That's not my verse. <laughs> and when you got ready to make man, the Bible says he breathed. I'm walking through the text. Into man. And man became a living soul. He breathed with him. Man began to be a living soul. And then man began to breathe back with God. On the rhythm. And as he began to breathe back, blood began to run through his body. And the rhythm, his heart began to beat in rhythm. Is running, his heart is in a rhythm, and he's all in a rhythm with God. And the earth is spinning, the world is spinning, the man is connected with his God, and he's connected to his rhythm. World is spinning with a rhythm. The sun appears in a rhythm, the moon manifest in a rhythm, and out of that rhythm, verse 14 said, became days, became signs. Became seasons, things we call winter, spring, summer, and fall, and all of these cycle on a rhythm. Come on, preacher. You want to walk with God? You got to catch His rhythm. You follow that? You got to catch His rhythm. In fact, if you're going to walk with anybody, you need to catch their rhythm. You know, don't marry somebody. I mean, some of you are too late, but don't marry somebody. You don't have your rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> Everything operates with rhythm. God has rhythm. We call it seasons. Let me show you something real quick and I'll be done with you. The seasons are in rhythm and it's set to a continuity of time. You see that? The seasons are tied to time. Seasons have blessings and burdens. That's right. And God says, Your life cycle. It's just multiple moments of seasons. Come on, preach 
the challenge in your creation and understanding your relationship and how you come from creation to a fall is understanding and appreciating what season you're in. All seasons have beauty and blessings. When we were in St. Louis, um, um, the winter is, is a beautiful season. That's the beauty. When we got to St. Louis, I had never seen snow that white. And when we got there, the first, the first winter was real pretty. Um, the first time it snowed, it was real white. But then, I got the burden. It stayed on the ground for two weeks. Negative 12 degrees. Made it hard to get outside. But you can't embrace the beauty without accepting the burden. Come on, preacher. Then it turned spring. See, the winter didn't stay all the time. It turned spring. And I love the spring. Uh, the, the spring was pretty. You got bees and butterflies and all that stuff going on out there. That was beautiful. Then the bird, it rained all the time. Yeah. Right. Then you have the summer come. And then the summer uh, is nice, it's pretty. Uh, the days are clear. Uh, the temperatures were good. The sun is shining. But the bird, Got real hot. Yes, sir. And it made it hard to breathe. Yeah. You follow that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then the fall came. And you look forward to the fall. The leaves change, the trees change, all the flowers are changing. Beautiful. Yes, sir. God was, was, was a painter. Yeah. And the bird. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Every season comes with its burdens. The weather will just change. With no warning in the fall. Every season has beauty and birth. We have to learn to understand and appreciate what season we're in in our life. Everybody is in a season. The struggle is, is when you're trying to live in a season that you passed. The art of living is learning to live in the season that you're in. And not try to get stuck in a season that's already gone. You need to learn to live with what is as opposed to what was. Come on, preacher. That season is gone. So then we end up in trouble. Because we're trying to make a season fit that that's, that's past. Or, you know, more people lose control over their marriages, over their lives, over their ministries, even their jobs, because they're trying to affix to something that used to be. And that no longer is. Amen. You gotta know. You gotta know. See, see, you may be good. Watch the fall. You may be good at giving him or giving her what they used to need. But that season is gone. Now you're trying to figure out why you don't communicate and have the, the laughter that you used to have because one of you is in a different season. Mercy. Amen. There's nothing worse. There's nothing worse than seeing somebody trying to live their lives in the wrong season. Come on now, preacher. I mean, you're 85 years old. Walking out in a minisk. I'm like, drop it like it's hot. Let me tell you, that's all right if you drop it, but who gonna get it back up? Wrong season. You riding around with your car top down in December. That worked good in March. Wrong season. It's all right, preacher. But when it comes to me, after Adam. Experience God's rhythm. He finds himself at distance. All right. God says, Adam, where are you? It's not geographical. He says, Adam, where are you in life? Are you equipped? Are you dressed? Are you prepared for the season that you're in? That's a good question. Are you equipped? Are you dressed? For the season that you're in, in your marriage, in your life, in your ministry, on your job, as a parent. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Or are you expecting something to happen 
at a season that's not appropriate for the season that you're in. Come on, preacher. Where are you? See that? He's praying for something that is out of perspective. What God has in mind for you, it's not the right time. And you're trying to force a season of life. God says, has already passed. He's the God of your season. He's the God that has ordered your steps. He is the God that has every season in his control. And since we don't get to rehearse our seasons, we have to learn how to embrace the beauty and the birds of every season of life. One of the things I want to share with you, and I want you to be able to do this, is be able to say, God, help me. Not to become discontent with my season. There's nothing worse than being discontent with your season. See, contentment comes when you understand what season of life you're in. And when you can see the beauty of wherever you are, We struggle with contentment. Because we always want something different. Single folk want to be married, married folk want to be single. That's a contradiction. If you're thin, you, you drink your weight gain, and if you have too much weight, you're taking diet pills. You always want something different. But man, what if you found contentment? In the season you're in. If you're too dark, you want to be light. If you're light, you want to be dark. If you have too curly, you want to be straight. And if you're straight, you want to be curly. And then if you lose it, you're trying to figure out how to get it back. <laughs> Those are seasons, man. That's not supposed to let go. That's when, when you lose your hair, you can do uh, uh, that, that little saying they say, let go and let go. <laughs> you know what season you're in? So what does it take? Now what does it take to live a life when you appreciate your seasons? All right, preacher. All right. You got to have hope. I'm done. I just want to share a thought with you. You got to have some hope. But you got to have a hope that understands that trouble doesn't last. Always. You got to have a hope that understands that trials won't stay. A hope that says problems will come. But I serve a God who's a problem solver. You got to have a hope that understands that your best days have not come. Your best days are not behind you. But you gotta understand your seasons. Let me help you with something real quick. Faith is the currency for heaven. See, money is a weird thing. Money is weird. It's the currency for this earth. But it's weird because you can't eat it, you can't dress it, you can't drive it, you can't take it with you, and since it's worth nothing, give me your worthless stuff. <laughs> it's worthless. Money cannot do anything for you in heaven. The current it's all money is. Is your ability to trade. That's it. Mercy. That's all it does. That's all right. Faith is the currency in the eternal. Money can't help you there. In the spirit world, the currency that runs the economy in heaven is never money. Mercy. Come on, preacher. It's always faith. God says, if you have the faith, I can provide it for you. God says, if you believe it, I can manifest it. Cool. Hebrew writer says, through faith, he formed the worlds by the word of his power. Listen to that. Through faith, he formed the worlds. I just told you. 
He formed the worlds through faith. In fact, it says through faith. We understand that the worlds were free. That's it. That's it. By the word of God. Eons. He says through the ages. He's framed the worlds. Can I tell you what that says? Your time has been framed by the word of God. God has fenced you. God has put a fence around your time. That if you go too far to the right, you run into a fence. If you go too far to the left, you run into a fence. If something happens in life and you get angry, you run into a fence. God has framed you. That's all of that. He would write a sentence for by faith. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. When you belong to God, here's what he says. I put boundaries on you. Be careful. So you don't go too far. That does not mean you won't be disciplined. That's what a fence is. And long before man introduced it, God had them electrical fences. That you go over there and you get too far, something happens to you. They get shocked over there. And you try to go over here, and you get shocked over there. All these invisible cars. To frame. You frame the words. Let me tell you what that says. You are You are held together. You are free by God. Because other people may run free and do what they want, but when you belong to God, He says, I free you. And when you are free, and I tell you something, here's what's beautiful about being a child of God. And if this is not what's happening, we need to mature into this. When you are a child of God and you are framed, you don't get to just say what you want to say. You are framed. You don't get to tell folk off and walk off. You're framed. And when God frames you, is a protector. And since you're framed by God, we may not know what the future holds, but we absolutely know who holds the future. Because not only can he take care of you, he's already cleansed you with the blood. He's already protected you with his grace. The spirit has come and built a fence around you. Can I show you something? This framing stuff. This framing stuff. Here's what God says. This framing stuff is, is so real. I'm going to share something with you that's absolutely real. When you look at that text, when you get a moment, go read Job chapter 1, 2. Read the whole book, but go read chapter, Job chapter 1, verse ch and chapter 2. One of the accounts is going to tell you. When you read the story of Job, it's going to say on one day, yes, sir. Yes, sir. when the sons of God, when the B'nai Elohim came in the presence of God, I'm going to share something with you, and we're going to talk about it. The sons of God are often referred to as the B'nai Elohim, the sons of God. That is a hierarchy in the heavens. And everything that's in the heaven are not angels. Angels are messengers. The B'nai Elohim are never referred to as the Malak, which are angels, messengers. You have the B'nai Elohim, sons of God, and you have angels. Come on, preacher. Come on, 
проклета. Сход за Бати. Ти позитив все аз бихо думав. Ти бе не Елохим Хамс. Ти позитив все аз бихо Елохим. And the Satan. Showed up. I'm telling you why I'm telling you that. The Satan. The word Satan is not a proper name. It simply means adversary. The Satan adversary. Because the word Satan means adversary. There's on one occasion where Jesus is referred to as a Satan. When he is opposing the devil, Jesus is referred to as the Satan because Satan just means adversary. I am against that wheel. All right. And when the adversary, the Satan, shows up, God says, where you been? He says, listen, I've been, I've been down there um, in Little Rock walking back and forth Trying to see who I can uh, 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 discredit. Can I tell you something? All he's doing is his job. All he's doing is his job. Um, he says, well, now watch this. Satan, the Satan, does not bring up Job. He does not. Where you been? On the earth. Trying to trick him. He didn't say that. But you know Seeing who I can discredit. Elohim says, Have you, adversary, considered my servant, Job? Ain't nobody like him. God is bragging on Job. Watch the conversation. I told you you were framed, didn't I? The Satan responded, The reason I haven't messed with Job is you have a friend. Around him, you protected his stuff, you protected his property, you protected his family. I tell you what, if you remove the frame, come on, preacher, he'll curse you to your face. That's so. God says, I'm gonna remove the frame from his stuff, I'm gonna remove the frame from his property, I'm gonna remove the frame from his his family, but I will not remove the frame from his soul. And as long as you can keep your soul right, even if you lose your stuff, God says, I still have you protected. Come on, I framed you. Come on, I framed you. And he says, he says, the only reason I ain't messed with you, because you got a frame on it. And follow that. As long as you keep your heart right. Everything might get attacked. As long as you keep your heart right. Even if he attacks everything. The contract says, I will prosper and be in good health just as my soul prospers. Because my soul is framed by God. You can't just walk up and touch me just because you want to touch me. Satan says, I can't go touch Job just because I want to. I got to get permission because he's framed. Now, hold on. Here's the struggle. And I'm done. Here's the struggle. All that stuff happened to Job. And Job knew nothing about it. Because Job's name came up in a meeting that he knew nothing about. Is it possible that you could be going through what you're going through? Not because you're such a bad fellow, but a meeting could have took place. Come on, preacher. And your name came up in the meeting. And rather than you say, God, take it off of me, take it off of me, we're all going to say, God, thank you for trusting me with trouble. Because here's what I know. At the end of the day, I'm a friend. I'm a friend. That's why when people try to to get to you, people try to hurt you. That stuff doesn't work out. We ran into a fence. And here's how good they ran into a fence. 
Because when they try to get to you, they can't get to you, and they can't come in further, they just stand there like this. <laughs> Holding on to the fence, watching you walk away. <laughs> I don't know what you're stressed out about. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what you're worried about. But because you are free, because you are free, I want you to know that God the Lord has heard you. He knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what you're going through. And he wants you to know that he has enough grace for the season. And if you would trust him in the season, he says, I can show you how to appreciate the beauty and the burden that you carry in the season. Amen. I am praying for you. For creation. You trust in me more than you trust in the one that hired you. The right to embrace you. And may you appreciate your beauty and your burden. Just appreciate the fact that I serve a God who loves me enough to pray. God bless you. Thank you so much. Yeah. 
Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. In the kingdom. Amen. 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 Sing it over. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's stop. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm not going to preach, but I am doing a little fuss. <laughs> well, I'm going to say it this way. I'm going to go ahead and praise God. Y'all can praise with me. Come on. Let's start it over. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. In the kingdom.
and move us forward a little bit. But what a blessing. I've heard some of the some of the lines tonight. I want to think about for us uh, what, what it means to be human. Now you might make me think to yourself, I I've been human all my life. Right? I know all about being a person. And that's true. We know a lot about being human. We know about the pains and the joys of uh, being physical and uh, living the everyday life on earth. And I don't think that's unimportant. I think we bring all of that into, into reflection. But also digging deeper into what does it mean? What does God want? What does God intend for us by being human? That he right. creates us. And that's what we're focusing on. I want us to just to pause and meditate on this line that you are made by the Lord, right? You're a person who is has been created by the Lord. And it sounds kind of obvious, but it's that's big and that's profound. And uh, sometimes I think we've done this already, all of those little studies in school and so but uh, we need to do it again just to breathe. We have this line, both in Genesis 1 Genesis 2. We'll see it again. That's where we're going to be tonight, Genesis 2. It's to breathe. That God breathed the breath of life into the nostrils. Yes, sir. You know, so that now when we breathe, with every breath, we breathe the breath of God. Right. Just by being a human, we are of God. The wind of God, the breath of God, my favorite verse is in Psalm 104, 29, and it's just talking about being terrified when God hides his face. The first line is, when you hide your face, where people are terrified, when you take away their breath, that word is wind, when you take away their wind right there, they expire. Yes, you stop living. And to dust they return. And when you send your breath, your ruach, they are created. And you breathe the air. That's the same wind that's there in Genesis 1, 2. And that's the same wind, although a different word, that we're going to see in Genesis 2. That it's God brings into his people. So when we breathe, we breathe the breath of God. Yeah, we are the breath. So I've had this experience. I'm just taking a biology class. I'm uh, but uh, it hit me at one point in my life that uh, I am human, and I'm wonderfully made, and so are all of you. And I remember looking at my hand and thinking, it's so interesting. Like, all that goes into your makeup and your body is far beyond my comprehension. I know maybe some of you understand the details that God creates but in, in more detail than I do. And yet there's a mystery and a wonder and an awe that just you are a person who is made. And I submit to you that you're a person who is made on purpose. Right. For a reason. And these chapters, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, tell us about what it means to be a person. What God wants from you as a person. So here we go. In Genesis 1, 26. Right? So I know my verse, uh, my section officially begins with 1, 26. And pick up a little bit where we left off. And uh, in chapter 126, we get this first reason. You're made for. I'm going to give you five of these. And I don't have the five, five fingered exercise. I don't have them up on the screen or anything like this. But we'll come back to each one of these. And they're pretty quick. But we're just going to read this text closely and see what God reveals to us. What it reveals to us. So starting in 126. God says, let us make man in our image, right? We've heard a good word about that tonight. And in our image, he created them, Lord. In the image of God, he were, they were created. And then it tells us, let us make, so let us make people, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion or rule. And that's not these soft serve. This is rule. Let them rule over the fish of the of the birds in the air, over the land animals, over all living creatures, those of the sky and the sea, those of the land, of all spaces. 
basis. We're supposed to rule. Yeah, yeah. All right, so now what does that mean, right? Because we can be good rulers and we can be bad rulers. That is. So in the ancient world, <coughs> when the king ran his empire, say, for example, this king of Assyria, Perez, that's all right. It's this king who ruled all other peoples. But he couldn't be everywhere. The way that he might assert his rule was by setting up a statue in a fort. And we found some of these statues. And on that statue, there might be a picture of him, and a statue of that king. But on that statue, he would he maybe give the law, the law of the land, or his rule. And a few of these statues would have the same words that you've seen at this point. The likeness uh, and the form of the king. In other words, right. the statue represents Follow me on this. Where if if that's maybe kind of in the background, or people are at least ex, ex, have experienced this, where this statue stands for the likeness. It looks like the king, but it's not just about looking like the king. It stands for the authority. What that statue says, I'm in charge. Yeah. Right? You have to submit to me. I am king, and this statue is my likeness and my form. All right. All right. So now. The same words are used for you and me and for people. And God is using them to say, well, you are my form. Yeah, you're supposed to rule. You represent me. Right? So you are kings over the earth. Now, of course, we got to think about being kings like God. We want to represent the kind of rule that God has. shortchange that. You're not just one of the creatures. You're made to rule. God has a very high view of human beings. And he expects, and we can't forget this, we know you may not have a very high view of humanity. Yes. Like there are days when I don't have a very high view of humanity, right? Yeah. Maybe I don't even have a very high view of myself, and yet we're called back to this. No, we're called we're expected, we're desired to be in charge, put in charge. But we know how the story goes, too. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try to skip too far ahead in the story. I'm gonna try to hang out tonight in Genesis 2. But we know how the story goes in Genesis 3 and 4. And we know how our story goes. We know how the, the world works around us. Uh, the state of humanity is not always looking like just rule. But God still I recall my parents leaving town. My parents are in the furniture business. I might come back and say, these are representatives. In other words, they sell furniture to retailers. You go to the retailer, somebody sold them that furniture, they go on behalf of, I don't want to get too far into the business. Long story short, they left town for a week sometimes. <laughs> I don't know, but they, they, first of all, they trust me, right? And they also put us in charge. I had in the middle. So I wasn't totally in charge. My older sister was in my charge. So I'll blame it on her. Because it didn't always go well, right? All right. We know how the story goes. We know that it does not always go well. And yet the expectation is there. I was their I was their son, so I am their son. Right? I was left in charge to represent the family. That's awesome. Right? I'm thankful for that. Yeah, but didn't always excel in that. So we know how the story goes, and yet we need to come back to this. You're called to rule. Again, Genesis 1 and 2 uh, is, is a woman. But in verse 28, he blesses her. Right? So we don't go, we don't rule without the blessing of the Lord. The Lord blesses them. And God says to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Another word, word for rule charge over, and to have a dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Again, to be put in charge. But now there's something more. This blessing has real effect. If the Lord blesses somebody in Genesis, know that it's going to happen. It's not just, hey, I wish you well. No, like God is enacting. The power of God is at work. 
This is the blessing of the Lord. And here, the, the blessing is be fruitful and multiply. So the second thing he says for them to do is to multiply. Yeah. Uh -huh. this, he doesn't just give this to humanity, by the way. Like We have other things that are multiplying. The fish are teeming. They're yeah. growing, right? Yeah. Yeah. But this, this little verse right here is essential for all of Genesis and Exodus. When we get, if you look at the very beginning of Exodus, in chapter 1, verse 7, we get this description. The people of God, Israel, are in slavery, Good. Good. right, under Egyptian authority. And for years, they have been oppressed, and a new pharaoh has grown up, forgotten about Joseph and all the blessings he brought to the people. And if we get to chapter 1, verse 7, it says, it refers back to this, and it uses the same language for how, how the people have multiplied. Flip over there with me, Jesus. Look at this. All right. Because you see it in the patriarchs, you see it all, all the way through, but then we get to the introduction of Exodus, and it says, But the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. In other words, the Lord has come through on his blessing, at least with the people of Israel. But it starts here, and that little verse streams all the way through to Genesis. So what does it mean to multiply, right? Uh, well, maybe it's obvious in some way. They're supposed to have kids. But I think it's more than that. It's multiplying right. to fill the earth, right? And to subdue, to take care of. These people are called to be creative. Mm -hmm. All right. Right? So you got yeah. Yeah. to rule. And I would say the second point is that God made you to be creative. Just like God is creative. He does good work. And he's called yeah, us yeah, yeah. to do good work, to be fruitful. He makes the trees fruitful. He puts that seed in it so that it will multiply. And he puts the seed in people so it will multiply and to fill the earth. Now, there's something cool here about Genesis 1. We're, I know we're still hanging out here in Genesis 1. But on, on days 1, 2, and 3, he creates these spaces, right? Yeah. He got, you know, he, he creates realms. Of the sky and the sea and the dry land. And then he fills those realms on days four, five, and six with poetry to the way that God creates this is that rhythm. That's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he fills those spaces. He fills day one, the sky space with that sun, moon, and stars, right? He fills day two, that sea space with the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and other stuff. And then he fills day Three, the land space with land animals, and then ultimately humanity. And then the climax of it is that he rests. But he puts things in order. If you need a good theological reason to clean a closet, know that God doesn't right? And he has made you to do that. Right? You order and you fill. If God does that in Genesis 1. He, he wants that for us. He wants our lives to have order. Right? That's that's a godly characteristic. That's what it means to be human. That's what he's made you for. Alright, and then we move on in this story. We get to, and I'm skipping the Sabbath. Know that I don't want to. The Sabbath is important. Right? Maybe I won't say a word. Alright, I don't want to skip it. Because he has made you to rest. This story doesn't tell you that he's made you to rest, but God does. Not because he's so worn out, not because he's panting and he can't go any farther. It's because he's done, at least for now. He's done with the work that he had planned. And then he blesses that day and he sanctifies it. He makes it holy. He sets it apart. And he observes what he observes what's good. In fact, he observes what's very good. Yeah. Okay? And later on, we'll, we as people will be called in to participate in that and to rest. And I'm going to say some things about work, but don't miss this, that God needs you to rest. And it's not just because you're tired, either. It's because you need to learn that it's not all up to you. And that's hard, right? That's probably the hardest part of this. If you're a responsible person, then you tend to think, it's up to me. And that's good. It's good to be responsible. But you need to know this is God's work, and you just get to participate. Right? The Sabbath teaches you that. Yes, sir. Right. So when we move on to the second story, and there are kind of two segments, right? We get sort of a new story in some way in chapter 2, verse 4. 
And we even get a kind of a new time frame, you know, on the day that God made earth and heaven. And two through three, and even into four, it's kind of, in some ways, a wisdom story. It's about, it's about what happened. It's also about what happens. All right? It's about what it means to be human. What it means to disobey, what God expects. There's so much that's laid out here. And I just want to take us through the first part of this. And then tomorrow we're getting to chapter 3. But the third thing that this story teaches us is that we're made to work. And I just said you're made to rest as well. All right? You have to have both. And this story begins in verse 5. When no plant of the field was yet, and no herb of the field had sprung up, for the Lord God had not created or had caused it to rain. So there's no rain on the earth yet, right? And there was no one to till the ground. So that word right there, till, is simply to serve or to work. And there's a word play here I'm going to tell you about. There's lots of fun word, not just fun, but insightful word plays here. All right, all right. Uh, uh, but the stream would rise to the earth and water the whole face of the ground. And then verse 7, right? So the Lord God formed, that's a word like a potter means. It's a pot, God it's like a potter in this story. Yeah. Playing yeah. in the dirt. Yeah. Whereas in Genesis 1, he just, we know that he just speaks with ease. God, all God has to do is whisper it and it's created. But in this story, he kind of gets down with us. And he's forming things in the dirt. He takes some of the dirt and he forms man, Adam. Right? From the dust of the ground, the Adama. So you have the Adam, that's the word for man, the word for ground. Adama, so Adam from Adama, people, humanity, man is taken from the dirt. So right, and God forms that dirt into a person, mm -hmm. and we get at least part of the reason why in verse five, because it says there is no Adam yet to work the Adama. Mm -hmm. So at least part of the reason is this, and we skip down to verse fifteen. The Lord God took the man, the Adam, and put him in the Garden of Eden. And by, and we're going to come back to the part of this. To work, to work it, and keep it. So why did he create man? Well, there's there's more reasons than this, but this says to work the ground. All right. Uh, are farmers? North Little Rock? Maybe? <laughs> I am not a farmer. But I've, uh, my wife is from Nebraska. And the worst job I ever had was one summer. In some ways, the most blessed job because I got to work with her. We spent the first year, first summer of our, of our marriage roving. And what that means is you're walking up and down cornfield lanes. That's, I'm sure there's a more accurate term for that. <laughs> and pulling up that corn that doesn't belong there. That is miserable. <laughs> We get we get that misery in chapter three, <laughs> but this this is more this this has got to be pleasurable. This is gardening at its best, but it's still work. And people are created to do good work. The Adam from the Adama, it's who we are, and maybe it's tilling or plowing, but it's like the groundling from the ground, right? It's 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 our makeup. It's what God makes us. Um, I want you to notice, and we're going to come back to this at the very end, but just notice that God goes first in every case. God rules, right? God makes, multiply, and blesses, and God works. God does good work. And he works his work for work. I don't know if that makes sense, but he does his work. Uh, he makes us for work, to do work, to follow him. So in Genesis 1, and this we have this evaluation. God stands back at the end of every day and says, it's good. I've done the good work. Right? And humanity is a part of that. To do good work, Ephesians 2, verse 10, for we are what he has made us. He's created us in Christ Jesus for good works, right. which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. 
Like right. this is what God plans for us. I'm, what I want for humanity, what I want for people is to do good work. Like I do good work. Putting things in order, fulfilling, for, for being responsible, for being timely. God's timely. Everybody else who takes the breaks. Right? But this this is God has planned these things out for us. And here, this is a beautiful verse, I think, picking up on chapter two and, and other creation texts that he created in Christ Jesus for good works. That which he's prepared ahead of time to be our way of life. He's made us to do good work. If we read on in this story, we come to the part actually flipping back, but also on, the story kind of goes back and forth. One thing I skipped over are is these two trees, right? We have two trees that are planted in the middle of this garden. All right, for that. And yes. so he starts, he starts in, and God emphasizes the abundance. Here is the emphasis. When he says to Adam, he says, I have made all of these trees for you to eat. You can eat anything. Here, that's the emphasis here. The Hebrew backs that up. It's got an emphatic form of the saying of, of God's abundant grace and provision. He says then, but don't <laughs> eat these two trees. And no uncertainty. Or sorry, this one tree. Yes, this sir. tree of knowledge of good and evil. He doesn't say whether they should eat tree of life, but they're they're there by it. Yeah, yeah. Right? So we have this in verse 9. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow in every tree that is pleasant to the sight and to good for food. God doesn't make junk. For the tree of life is also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. All right. So now, if you look forward in the story, we get to hear a little bit more. What we learn, I think, is that God's made us to decide. All right. You gotta, God's made us people to have decisions to make. Right? Even in the very beginning, he gives them a choice. And he wants them to choose what is good. He wants them to choose what is like. Yes. Right? But he, he has equipped, and I well, one of the ways reason, one of the way of reading this, these stories is that he's equipping them with being able to make that good choice. Right. Even though we see them make the bad choice, mm -hmm. in some ways they're more equipped to make a good choice after chapter two. All right. So we, anyway, we have, and we, when we look at this phrase, knowledge of good and evil, what does that mean? It means the, having the ability to know what is good and to choose it, and to know what is evil and to not choose it. But it's the, it's the knowing. All right. Yeah. You know, God has the knowledge of good and evil. God knows the difference between good and evil. In fact, he makes an evaluation in verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good. Just being able to make that decision is saying God has the knowledge of good and evil. Where we see that phrase show up a couple of other times in the Bible, it's about kids. Kids don't have the knowledge of good and evil. And that's associated with kids. Now, I always ask this question in my classes, like, how old were you when you learned what's good? Yeah, all right. right? Yeah. I get the answers that range from, like, 2 uh, to 25. <laughs> <laughs> and, Dude, I'm still learning, right? <laughs> and that's the truth. Oh, yeah. But there, there is, I, and then I say, well, how old were you when you felt like you, you probably shouldn't run around naked in the house or, or outside and you felt like you put some clothes on? Well, that's important to this story because they grow up in a sense of the story, right? When they eat that, that fruit of knowledge of good and evil, they get the knowledge of good and evil, and what do they know? They feel shame, right? Because now they know they've made They've made an evil choice. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, there are consequences. Now I know I'm just talking about chapter 3. There are consequences to that, but there's also grace in that story of maturity. And it's every one of our stories. You grow up, you know that not, you know that knowledge of good and evil. The issue in chapter 2, is, I think the reason that God says don't need it, is to cap, because he wants them to depend on him. Right? They do it their own way. They shortcut his plan. Right, right. But he has made them to decide nonetheless. There's a kind of simplicity to this. Um, 
I heard somebody say recently when he was a teenager, he said he had made a mistake. And, you know, he had learned his lesson. I imagine that you have all had these experiences. You've messed up and you're being confronted with your sin uh, by an authority figure, right? Much like this story that plays out. And uh, the goal, in most cases, or in all of these cases, is to learn from your mistakes, right? Yeah, and this, yeah. that this brother at church said, one, my best dad, advice my dad gave me was to learn from other people's mistakes. All right. All right. I was like, that's good. That's a good word. And we can learn something from what Adam and the woman need. The And yet, isn't this awesome? That without the decision to follow God, there is no relationship. Right. And the last thing here, but our five, I'm not going to rehearse all of these here, but the last thing is that he's made humans to relate. All right. right? And you can't have a relationship without a choice. Right. 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 If I'm making you do something for me, you're, if you're not choosing right. to do something for me, that's, not, that's no kind of relationship. And God so wants right. more than that. God wants you to decide. God wants you just to follow him willingly. Right. Not to, he's not going to drag right. you along. Right. And there might be times where he pushes and nudges and prods and disciplines, right? We're living in his will. He's planned this out for us. But God wants you to choose. Because that's where love is. That's where the relationship is. And God has made us to relate. So when we look again in chapter 2, in verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper, which is a partner. So out of the ground, God works by trial and error a little bit here. All right. He makes the Lord God forms, the same word that he uses for man, every animal of the field and every bird of the air, and brought them to the man to see what, what, what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. So all of these animals are proceeding before Adam, and he's naming them. And the man gave the names to the cattle and the birds of the air and every animal in the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper that was suitable to him. That was his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and he closed up its place. Flesh and the rib, rib that the Lord God had taken out from the man. This translation has, he made into a woman. That word is built. He built her. So he forms everything else in this, in this story, but there's this unique word, this special word for a woman. All right. And he built her. I don't know all the significance of that. All right. Talking about a well built woman or something here. Uh, but there is. It's unique, and there's other unique features here, right? So when the man first sees her, here we have our second poem. This one at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. So we have a nice wordplay in English, woman and man. That's in Hebrew, too. You have ish and isha. So the isha is taken out of the ish, just like Adam is taken out of the Adama. Now, Isha is taken out of Isha. There's this relationship that man has with the ground. There's this relationship that man and woman have with one another. Right. And it all is embedded in the relationship that yes, God sir. wants with his people. Yeah. Yeah. He's made us to relate to each other. He's made yeah. us to relate yeah. to him. Yeah. Right. And verse 24 goes on. That's why a man leaves his father and mother and clings. He clings. He holds fast to his wife. And they become one flesh. And the man and the wife were naked, and they were not ashamed. That's what we're leaving off for tonight. We, there's more of this story, right? Yeah. There's a symmetry to what God has created. Dr. Jackson said so earlier, this kind of rhythm. I think we see this rhythm here. Right? There's relationships that are broken. Right? We know about broken relationships. We know about broken husband and wife relationships. 
parent and child relationships, brother and brother, sister and sister, neighbors with one another, employer and employee, and creator and creature. And you no doubt have experienced, maybe you are experiencing broken relationships, maybe you're experiencing a relationship that's been broken for a long time. The, in, the ideal world, and that's what we're talking about, what God wants. He has an ideal. And it's not just some uh, far-out dream of God's. No, this is what he's made us for. There's harmony and grace and justice in these relationships. So we, we know that things have changed since the days of Eden. We grew up, right? We learned what evil is. Therefore, we know what is good, too. We sinned, we toil by the sweat of our brow and experience pain in childbirth. And that's not just having a lot of pain when a baby is born, but also having a lot of pain in raising a child, right? It's not easy. We experience these broken relationships. We see this play out in Genesis 3 and 4. 4 is the first time we get sin. Sin is crouching at your door, like a, ready to devour you, like a roaring lion. And we know about that broken uh, brotherly relationship there. But none of this changes what you're made for. You're made to rule. You're made to be creative. You're made to work. You're also made to rest. You're made to choose life. So right. And you're made to relate. To the Creator. Yeah. So right. There's nothing better than relating to the Creator. And maybe that seems bigger than what. Maybe that seems sort of abstract. Like how do? What does that look like? Well, it looks like working. It looks like ruling. It looks like acting with justice. It looks like resting in God. Um, to recognize that you are made for these purposes. You are not left on your own for this work, because God. Because God blesses to multiply. Because God does work. And God decides what is good and what is not good. And God relates to us. God's come near. Right? God has prepared every good work through Christ Jesus. Yes, sir. And that work within us. We're called to be reps, representatives, followers, um, Surely Jesus himself is the full embodiment of what it means to be human, what God expects of what it means to be human. We know about the divinity of Jesus. Don't hear me wrong. But God shows us what it looks like to be the ideal person <coughs> in the coming of Jesus. If you want to know what God expects of people, look at Jesus. Right? Look at the one who is just, who is the king of kings, who is the ruler. He knows how to rule. He knows how to work. He knows how to be creative. Right? He showed us how to relate. He showed us how to choose life, to choose what's good. And to Amen. Yes. He shows us he's the full representation of God, the highest embodiment of what it means to be human. I want to pray for you all. Is that all right? Pray for us. God, thank you for... Wow, we just pause before you. You are the creator of all things. We recognize that you sit on the throne, Lord, above all else. Yes. And we bow down and recognize you as the ruler, as the one who began creation uh, through a breath and a word, and the one who has filled us with that same breath to just be at home and in your work. God, thank you for the work that you set in front of us. And I pray over relationships we have. Whatever is coming to mind right now, God, for our brothers and sisters, your children who you care so much for, Lord, I pray that you will bring peace, you'll bring dependence, you'll, you'll help us to trust in you more fully. Yes. And we need you, God. You know that. Yes. And uh, we often ignore that. We trust in your forgiveness and and I just give you praise for using us and working your will in spite of us. Yeah. But God, we want to be more fully yours. We want to be more fully dedicated to you. 
We want to be people who act out your kingdom in forgiveness and grace and justice uh, to represent you. Uh, and Lord, pray that your kingdom comes in its fullness as it, does in, as it is in heaven. Yes. Where you reign, God, we trust wherever you, uh, we trust you for the future. We know that we are with you and that's our hope and that's our joy and we give you thanks for that. Yes. Lord, I thank you for this story. Thank you for calling us into uh, what it means to be, to be created by you. You've made us, Lord. I praise you for that. Thank you for the moments of our birth. Thank you for uh, the days that we wake up and we serve and we work. And we want to do that more fully for you. God, we you rest in you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I think that we are off to a wonderful, wonderful start for this yes. lecture. Oh, yeah. yes. If you have uh, some, uh, someone that really need to know more about God and the purpose that He has for us. We want you to be here uh, first thing in the morning. Lectures begin at 9 30. So we want you to consult your, your bulletin, uh, your program, so that you'll know all of the events and the activities. I want to thank the school for allowing me to host uh, the, the lectures tonight. The MC, I turn you over now to President Lloyd Clay Harris. Thank you, Mr. President. Leading the session tonight, I to express our appreciation to both of our speakers tonight. Yeah, uh, yes. Very insightful instruction from the Word of God. I think we're off to a great start and getting back to the book of Genesis and getting a start from where God's people got their start is a great way to get into the Word of God and to find our focus, to get in our rhythm, and to find our work that God has for us to do. Amen. I want you to know we appreciate very much the contribution that you've made thus far for the lectures. I express our appreciation for everyone who's come tonight Amen. and invite you to come back again. Uh, a number of things will be taking place. There will be a latest session at 9 30 with Dr. Stephanie Lane, and there will be a next session with uh, Dr. Jackson and uh, Dr. Berry. is scheduled to be here. I don't think he's going to be able to make it. But uh, Dr. Jackson has handled many things by himself. <laughs> and uh, he was equipped for that. And we look forward to what he's going to say. Uh, for those aspiring for the ministry, uh, there's a workshop entitled uh, Preaching from the Old Testament uh, that I will be doing uh, also on tomorrow morning. Uh, these workshops will go uh, Monday, uh, Thursday, and Friday. I got Distracted back then. I think you were holding up a CD. Is that what you're doing? Uh, and he's letting you know that the CDs of the lectures will be available and you can check into the office in the back for getting those CDs. <clears throat> there will be a high noon lecture on tomorrow at 1130 just before lunch. Lunch will be served here on the campus uh, on tomorrow also. And then in the afternoon, lectures begin at 2 o'clock, and a number of the students will be presenting lectures throughout the week. And some of them will be speaking on tomorrow afternoon. And of course, the evening lectures begin at 6.30. On Friday evening, following the lectures, uh, there will be a banquet, the SRS Boardman Banquet at 5 o'clock. And the, the tickets are available. Uh, you can check with the SRS State in the <clears throat> Tickets are $12 to cover the cost of a meal. We'd like to invite everyone to plan to be there. One of the first instructors of the School of Religious Studies will be speaking at the banquet. And he is also the co-host of another banquet for the School of Religious Studies that takes place in the Mississippi Delta. And they have been supporting the school through that for many years. And uh, we'd like to, uh, he'll be speaking to us 
in the banquet on, on Friday afternoon, on Friday evening. Be sure to uh, check your schedule for events that are taking place. You know, the School of Religious Studies started 40 years ago, and we are getting ready to go into our fifth decade of training men for the edification of the body of Christ. And we solicit your prayers and your encouragement as we make this journey. As you know, we have a new facility that's on the table to be unleashed sometime soon. When I say soon, I mean when the board of directors get around to move in that direction. Uh, but it is on the table. But I do have a concern right now that I want to share with you. And uh, we have two students who would like to be a student at the School of Religious Studies. And I need to raise $2,000 to $3,000 to take care of them in their matriculation at SRS. If you'd like to help me raise this money, now there are envelopes in the queue. You can write SRS on your envelope and put whatever you'd like to give in that regard toward this. We're going to bring the students uh, to the school and we're going to help them get their training. And uh, we know God is going to provide. But I'm kind of like Paul was when he said, I know my God will supply your need. <laughs> so you can supply ours. <laughs> and so we'll, we'll count on God uh, to supply the need that's, that's good so that we can make, make this thing happen. But we really believe in these students and we believe that they're going to do great work for God. And we really want to be able to help them uh, get the training that they need. And if you can help in any way, we do appreciate that. And um, throughout this lecture series, we're hoping to get as close as possible uh, to that goal. Amen. Whatever I forgot to say tonight, I'll say in our next session. Thank you for being here. And at this time, We can take credit cards, we can take promises, we can take checks, we can take cash, uh, we can take PayPal, we can take whatever. Yeah, we can take. <laughs> and uh, don't forget, uh, just a reminder of the uh, film services for Sister Marjorie Ray at the uh, Rose City Congregation. That's at 11 a.m. on Saturday. So please pray for, for the family and also again to our sisters. Uh, if you if you could help out with the desserts, we would be more than happy to do that. Just give us a call and let us know uh, that you be, uh, and we'll have somebody available to do that for us. So again, I think we also want to include in our prayers to Elvis and Gillies and her family, uh, especially her grandchildren who are here right now. So let us great grand. Great grandchildren. Great, great, so let us stand here.